I was the White House number two correspondent. Sandra Van Erker was the number one. And uh, they called a conference on Vietnam in Honolulu. And uh, Salinger went to it, and the generals came from Vietnam, and the ambassadors, and uh, I think Dean Rusk went to Honolulu. They all had this big high-level conference because things had begun to go nasty. All the number ones and everything went to Honolulu, so the trip to uh, Dallas fell to me when the president took the, the Texas trip, my first big presidential trip other than to uh, Hyannis. And um, you feel very puffed up as a reporter the first time this happens. You, your luggage has on it trip of the president with the White House seal and all, and it's all handled by the White You know, it's all. After a while, you get used to it. And uh, anyway, we got to Fort Worth um, late at night and uh, I got to bed about two in the morning. Some of the Secret Service and some of the White House press corps went off to a nightclub, but I was just too beat and didn't go. And um, I made my arrangements with the NBC cameraman who was traveling with us, Mo Levy, um, and for the next morning. And I got up early the next morning and put my bag out in the corridor for the White House to pick up and um, went down to the press room and had a little, uh, the Chamber of Commerce had put on a little breakfast, and we had the copies of the speech that the president was going to deliver later that day, and we, so we all marked up our speeches and, and uh, wrote a little bit for, um, for a little later. Then we went to the breakfast. Uh, no, then we went outside to the parking lot and where there was a platform, and Jim Wright and Yarborough and Connolly, they were all lined up like guilty boys behind him, and the president spoke. And then he worked the crowd. And uh, I was very close to him, almost at his shoulder, as he went around working the crowd. And it was really extraordinary, the kind of what that crowd felt for him. I mean, and he emerged from it. I walked with him, right beside him, uh, back into the hotel. And uh, his eyes rested on mine a couple of times. He didn't know me well, but he knew me slightly. And his eyes were absolutely cold, always really cold cold gray. The smile was in the crinkles and in the mouth and the big teeth, but the eyes somehow remained, I always thought, very cold and calculating. Anyway, as he walked back into the thing, he reached into his uh, hip pocket and took out a clean handkerchief, and uh, he said, well, that was pretty good, very quickly, and he wiped his hand from shaking hands with it, and the handkerchief was black from all the, uh, and he put it back in his pocket. And then he went into the lobby of the hotel, and there was a crowd on both sides of the lobby funneling into the entrance for the breakfast, held beh behind ropes. And one woman, hysterical, said, I can't touch him. I've got to touch him. And like Leonardo's God. And, um, and uh, she, so Jim Wright reached out and he touched her with one hand and touched Kennedy with the other as though to transmit the spark. And the woman was ecstatic. So we went into the breakfast and uh, everybody knows the scene there with... Um, the Chamber of Commerce and the boys sang the, uh, the um, uh, Yellow Rose of Texas, the boys' choir, and uh, they tried to present Kennedy with a Stetson and boots, and he wouldn't put the hat on because he would never put a funny hat on. And he made the joke about, I'm sorry, no, he made the joke outside, I'm sorry, Mrs. Kennedy isn't here, but it takes her a little longer to get ready. Anyway, I was standing in the kitchen, hotel kitchen, with Godfrey McHugh, who was his Air Force aide, who always traveled on Air Force One with him. And there was Mrs. Kennedy in the kitchen, waiting, waiting, waiting for the entrance. And finally, when everybody said, where's Jackie, where's Jackie, then made the entrance to thunderous applause, huge success, so on and so on. And uh, it was full of good fun. And I said to uh, Mo Levy, the cameraman, well, we, if nothing else happens today, we've got a story with Jackie. Um, why don't you take that back to the Fort Worth station, and then we'll um, then we'll move on. So we we got in the buses outside and went off to the um, uh, plane, the press plane, at Fort Worth. The plane landed on this bright, bright day, and we got out, and uh, I had my um, uh, raincoat and briefcase with me, my suitcase had taken care of. So I ran to the. There were two press buses lined up. I um, ran to what looked like the first press bus, and put my stuff in a seat in the front, and then went back outside. And finally, um, Air Force One pulled up, and uh, I will just never forget the sight of that. It was, um, 
it was so bright my eyes ached in the sunlight. And then when Mrs. Kennedy came out and with this uh, pink uh, um, strawberry ice cream colored suit with the facings of navy blue turned inside out and the little pillbox hat to match, her hair glossy in this bright light, the vivid color and everything, it just, it, it looked surreal, surreally colorful. It was just, it made the eyes ache to watch. And then, when somebody at the foot of the plane handed her a huge bouquet of blood red roses, that, the color of those roses in that bright sunlight against the pink of the suit was really startling. I felt as though I'd smoked pot or something and had all the, uh, which I did once in uh, Tangier and saw what it does to your vision, your color vision. I mean, it enormously heightens your color vision. Anyway, it was as though I'd done that and uh, it was only one Bloody Mary. But um, So I followed them as they went along and shook hands along the fence. And as I said, you could get very close to them. And I was right beside Jackie when um, a hand reached through the chain link fence and broke one of the roses off and took it back inside. And there were people with a, high school kids with a banner over the fence that kind of lowered it on the president. But it was all very jocular and easy. And then um, they got into the uh, limousine and uh, I ran for the press bus and discovered that my stuff had been moved, or they'd moved the buses, so the one behind had come to the front and my stuff was in the other bus. Anyway, I had a seat right in front of the first press bus on one of the transverse seats right in the front on the opposite side from the driver. So we started off in the motorcade and we were about six cars behind the president's car. So, and being higher up, we could see over the uh, other cars and the Secret Service car and the pool car carrying the wire services and a couple of photographers. And uh, so in the early part, this is weird, it was the outskirts of Dallas were almost deserted. There were just a few people um, holding up signs. And I began to get a little drowsy. And uh, I had this daydream. And in my daydream, uh, somebody took a shot, fired a shot, and I got out of the bus and I chased the person who'd fired the shot. And then I, I sort of woke up and I said, come on, get real. And you know, there'd been a lot of stuff about some trouble expected in Dallas. And they'd got out every policeman, canceled all leaves, citizens given the right of citizens arrest, you know, they'd really put on the heavy security. So I shook myself up and began making notes of signs and things. And then we got in downtown Dallas and the street ahead of the motorcade looked like a river whose banks were constantly shifting because people would swell out in the crowd and then swell back and you wondered how the motorcade could get through them because they were weaving sinuously through this crowd of uh, uh, amazing to see. And the reception was euphoric, unbelievable. And we all kept commenting on all the nice things people were saying and shouting. And we got down to the end of the main street bef just before the turn into Dealey Plaza and I got out my notebook and began making a few notes because in a few minutes at the merchandise mart I, or the trade mart, I was going to have to do an NBC News on the hour and I knew what pieces of the speech I wanted to do excerpt. And we just turned into Dealey Plaza and I was just figuring what I would lead on when there was a bang and we all said, what was that? Was that a backfire? Was that a firecracker? What was that? And there was time for us to say that and then there was bang, bang, very close together like that. And I said, those are shots. Stop the bus. And the bus had one of those handles that opened the door. And uh, I, uh, I said, stop the bus. And I ran over on bus driver's arm and helped him open the door. And I jumped out. The bus door closed. It went around the corner. The air was filled with the most incredible screams I've ever heard. It was as though there were a bunch of choirs all deliberately shrieking out of tune and cacophonously. It was just un hysterical, unbelievable sound echoing off all these buildings in the plaza. So I knew really something had happened, but I didn't think he'd been hit. I thought somebody's fired a gun as a kind of demonstration. It was inconceivable to me. So I ran around the corner and the motorcade was just disappearing under the underpass. And then I noticed that there were people on the grassy knoll uh, who were sitting with their children bent down uh, and sort of half covering their children. And I noticed there were policemen and plainclothesmen with guns up running up the hill. 
So I ran with them. I got to the top of the hill against the fence by the overpass, and everybody paused there for a moment and looked around, and then the cops went over the fence, so I went with them. And there was nothing there, no signs of anything, except empty railroad tracks stretching away behind, um, behind with some trains parked quite far away. So I thought, geez, I better call NBC and tell them those shots were fired, and I ran back along the top looking for a place that might have a phone. And the first place they came to turned out to be the Texas Book Depository. So I ran up the steps, and as I did, a young man in shirt sleeves turned halfway up, came out, and I said, where's there a phone? Um, there's been shots. Where's the phone? He said, you better ask inside. I went inside. There was another young man on a phone by a pillar, and he pointed into an office. And I went into an office. There was one of those old black phones with four clear Bakelite, clear Lucite buttons, and two of them were lit up and two of them weren't. And I dropped one down and I got through to NBC in about 10 seconds in New York, the news desk. I said, this McNeil in Dallas, urgent, urgent. And somebody said, just a minute. And he put the phone down and I was screaming into the phone, for God's sake, come on, come on. Anyway, I did a bulletin saying um, shots were fired as the president's motorcade passed through downtown Dallas. It is not known if the shots were directed at the president. People screamed and lay down in the grass, da, da, da. Then I signed off and I went outside Policemen stopped me as I ran down the steps. I told him who I was. I had a White House badge on. And then a little black boy came along and said to the policeman to me, Mister, I seen a man with a gun up in the window there. And uh, the policeman ran away, or started to run away, and a woman came up hysterically and said, He wasn't hit, was he? He wasn't hit. And I said, No, I don't think so. The policeman said, Yes, ma'am, he was hit bad. We went over to the policeman's motorcycle where the radio on the motorcycle was saying, Taken to Parkland Hospital, severe head wounds. And I thought, Oh, shit. You know, I'm supposed to be covering the president, and here I've gone off on this goose chase, chasing some gunman, and, um, and I'm miles away from the president. So I ran out into Dealey Plaza. The traffic was congealed. It was all the horns were beeping. Police motorcycles were riding up over through flower beds and up steps. Uh, people were screaming, horns beep. It was unbelievable chaos. And I ran several streets until the farthest street feeding into the plaza farthest away from the book deposit, the traffic was moving. So I ran in front of the first car that came along and stopped it and opened the door. I said to the young guy, I'll give you five bucks if you to drive me to the Parkland Hospital. And he said, well, okay. And uh, five bucks was five bucks then. And, uh, and uh, I got in and he said, what's the matter? And I said, the president's been shot. He said, yeah, I heard that. I said, what do you mean you heard it? I heard it on the radio. Well, turn the radio on again. And he said, it's in the back seat. He'd heard the president had been shot on a little transistor radio, and he turned it off and put it in the back seat with a bunch of cake boxes he was delivering. Unbelievable. Anyway, I took him by the arm, I slid over by him in the seat, and I kept punching his arm, saying, drive faster, drive faster, NBC will pay any fines, don't worry, go through red lights, anything. Nobody could have cared less, because all the police cars were screaming the other way at 100 miles an hour past us. I got him to stop at a gas station, and I went in and did another bulletin to NBC saying he'd been hit in the head and taken to Parkland Hospital, da, da, da. He got me to the hospital uh, just a few minutes after the motorcade and the pool car. All the rest of the press had gone off to the merchandise mart in the buses, and they didn't turn up for a long time. So I went into the emergency room section, through the swing doors in the emergency room, and there's the emergency room desk, and there was Merriman Smith of the uh, uh, UP, dictating the story that won him the Pulitzer Prize that day, and the nurses all on his arm saying, you can't use this phone, you can't use this phone, and Smitty just went on dictating the story. I went up, and there in a little ante room, through another swing door, were two pay phones that nobody'd noticed. And I grabbed one of them, and I had it for the rest of the day, and I uh, got through to NBC. And then later, Bob Pierpoint of CBS turned up, and he had the one next to me. And uh, we would get interns or doctors or nurses to hold the phone while we went in to try and find out what had happened and um, talk to whoever we could, the priest who delivered the raft rites, um, to the various uh, aides. No, no one would say anything. Um, I said to the priest, if you deliver the last rites, does that mean he's dead? And he would say, I delivered the last rites. And that's all he would say. Then. Um, the Secret Service came through and said, everybody out, everybody out. And Pierpoint and I ducked down. There were glass panels in the door that swung out into the main lobby. We just ducked down on our phones. I'm talking to Huntley and Frank McGee in New York. He's talking to Cronkite. 
on the other phone. And they cleared everybody out. And then we peeked out, and here's Lyndon Johnson coming out, white as anything, surrounded by Secret Service men and aides. And we both dropped the phones, and we burst out like this. Johnson looked as though we were about to shoot him. I mean, oh my god. And the Secret Service pushed us out of the way, and Johnson just bowled his way past us. He knew us both very well. Uh, and bowled his way past us, went out. So we reported that he'd gone off. And then, um, then um, uh, later, Mrs. Kennedy came out, and we were, I was in the lobby as she came by with her hand on the coffin and the blood all over her skirt, and this extraordinary dazed look in her eyes that everybody saw. So they went off. NBC said, you better stay there. And we got lots of people in Washington and elsewhere. You better stay there in Dallas and see what happens there. And uh, so then it was announced before I left the hospital. And that's the huge difference from today. We didn't have a live camera there. No way of getting a live camera. You know, it was all film. It had to be taken back to Fort Worth and processed and then cut and then put on the air. Fort Worth was an hour's drive away, you know, all that. Today, you'd have... Instant uplinks everywhere. It all would have been, you know, I would have been like one of these CNN people, blah, 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 all the time from the thing. As it was, you did stories when you had something and could get through. So NBC only finally got a mobile unit going because it was broken down uh, in Fort Worth. They couldn't get the engine going on the mobile unit. So they uh, got a, um, a wrecker truck to hoist the front of the mobile unit up, and they drove it from uh, Fort Worth to Dallas in the record truck, truck and parked it outside the courthouse, and it was there for Oswald's transfer uh, when Pettit um, and Pettit, the NBC, Tom Pettit, the NBC reporter, live saying he's been shot. I got, you know, that famous scene. So it worked. But so I was still at the hospital, and I heard that this guy called Oswald had been arrested who worked at the book depository. And I said, isn't that odd? That's the building I went into. God, he must have been coming out about the time I went in. Didn't think anything more about it. I went down to the police station that evening. I saw Oswald as they paraded him back and forth twice. And I think, to make a long story short, about a year and a half later, I was back at NBC in New York, and William Manchester was just finishing the death of the president. He called me up and said, he, could I confirm that it was Oswald I had talked to on the steps of the book depositor? And I said, no, I couldn't. I was, didn't know the building had anything to do with the shooting at that time. I was just looking for a phone. I don't remember the man well enough. And he said, well, I'm convinced, and I'm going to say in my book that it was Oswald, because I've been all over the ground minutely second by second, and I've timed your call to NBC and where you were and where other people were. And did you know that Oswald told the Secret Service that night that as he was leaving the book depository, a young, blonde, crew-cut Secret Service man ran up the steps and asked him for a phone? And he says, I think Oswald mistook you for a Secret Service man because no Secret Service did go into the building. And I was young, blonde, with a short haircut, a gray suit on, and a White House press badge. And so that's what he says several times in the book, Death of a President. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. 